Um, welcome to the discussion with the 2015 uh, authors of The Compromis, um, sponsored by the Fletcher School. Um, I just want to thank, on behalf of the International Law Students Association, um, the Fletcher School for sponsoring this event and making it possible today. We are incredibly grateful to them for their support. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce to you today um, the three authors of the 2015 Compromis, some of whom you probably recognize. Um, I'm going to start on the far end of the table where we have Michael Pyle, then Dagmar Butte, and Stephen Schneebaum. Um, sitting next to Stephen is Professor Hurst Hanum from the Fletcher School, who is also going to be joining our panel this morning. Um, I'm going to ask each of the authors to uh, introduce themselves uh, a little bit more to you as we start the panel. And at this time, I would like to introduce you to um, John Burgess, who is a professor of practice and the executive director of the LLM program at the Fletcher School, um, to say a few additional words of welcome and to introduce Professor Hanum to you. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, the Fletcher School, which is the oldest school of law and diplomacy in the United States, is deeply honored to be able to sponsor this unique presentation where you have an opportunity to hear from and discuss issues with the Compromis authors. Like the Jessup competition itself, the Fletcher School is uncompromisingly focused on international law. Its law curriculum is exclusively confined to courses on public and private international law taught by a deeply experienced faculty, including my colleague on the right, Professor Hurst Hannum, who joined the Fletcher School in 1990 and, appropriately enough for today's discussions, uh, specializes in human rights, including issues of minority rights and national self-determination. And he has consulted with various UN bodies on those topics and appeared before tribunals in the Americas and in Europe on those questions. There is one additional aspect to the Fletcher School, which is another part of its international emphasis. In addition to focused international law courses, the school teaches law in the context of broader international relations, so that students taking law courses are also exposed to diplomacy, diplomatic history, economics, regional studies, business, issues that actually mold and influence the evolution of international law and are in turn themselves affected by the application of the rule of law. It's a little bit different in that regard from traditional law schools, but it's different by design. The goal of the school is to help to train leaders with a profound and sophisticated background in the law who may go into governmental work, non-governmental work, international organizations, or global business, or law, and to help assure that they have the appropriate grounding to do so. And of course, many of you are participating in this competition because of similar interests and aspirations. And I'd encourage you to take a look at the Fletcher website or to come talk to me afterward, or we have some brochures in the background, if you'd like to hear more about the program that I've outlined, one that offers a deep focus, but also a broad perspective for international law. And that is particularly why we're delighted that you can participate in this unique event. Most cases that lawyers have to deal with are very messy affairs. The facts are obscure. They're complicated by personal conflict, by issues of complex law. And even at the end of an inevitably imperfect adjudication process, sometimes critical facts are missing entirely or misunderstood or important legal theories are neglected. Here, we have the benefit of a case created by a sophisticated and knowledgeable group of practitioners that help to highlight the issues and now you have the opportunity to better understand them and to ask about them. 
This is a panel that I think, as you've gone through the case, obviously you recognize, has displayed imagination, sophistication, an element of subtlety, which may occasionally drift into the borders of deviousness, <laughs> as they've put together a, a case for you to have the opportunity to deal with during the course of the Jessup competition. So it's a unique honor and a pleasure to make this very special event available to you. And uh, I think at this point, uh, all I can say is that it's time to head off to the plains of Thanatosia. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Leslie asked us to introduce ourselves briefly. Uh, my name is Michael Pyle. And my name is Dagmar Butte. <laughs> and I'm Stephen Schnabel. There we are. Okay, well, I'm going to talk for much longer than that. Um, <laughs> my name is Hurst Hannum. Um, as you know all about me from John Burgess. Um, I just want to say a couple of things by way of introduction. And the first is that I had no responsibility whatsoever for writing this problem. Um, the second is that I want to emphasize uh, the mention of deviousness. Uh, I've had the, the distinct pleasure to work with in some ways and to know Stephen Schneebaum for many, many years. Um, and devious among wonderful and intelligent, all that is certainly something that I would apply to him. Um, the third comment I would simply make is that when I first started working in this area of human rights, and as John mentioned, I've dealt with self-determination issues for quite some time. And it was well over 20 years ago, and I certainly assumed that by now we would no longer be talking about them. Um, just this last Tuesday and Wednesday, I was speaking at a seminar at George Washington University Law School on self-determination and secession. And the only thing I can do to help reassure you and to suggest that all the time you spent over the last few months preparing and, and mooting and actually appearing before judges who have no idea what self-determination is either, um, is that if you think that there wasn't any clear answer, you're absolutely correct. Uh, that's actually not quite true. There is a clear answer to what self-determination means, but it's a very old-fashioned answer that has to do with decolonization and doesn't really have to do with any of the issues that appeared in, in this problem. Um, so, with that uh, disclaimer of any responsibility and uh, <laughs> expressing my admiration for you making it this far and being able to spend sleepless nights uh, over questions to which there are no answers, um, I will end my introduction. <laughs> and I suppose we could begin either with questions for you um, or I, I'll, should I give you, I'll give you one observation as I, as I read mm -hmm. through the, the, the compromis, which, simp which did demonstrate the deviousness, but also the depth of understanding that the authors have of self-determination and secession. And that's in the last couple of paragraphs where the requests to the court are, are set out. Um, the first one, Reverentia's um, encouragement violated territorial integrity is a fairly straightforward public international law question. But the two I want to focus on are part B of um, Agnostia's request, that the purported secession and subsequent annexation of East Agnostia are illegal and without effect. Mm -hmm. So we have two separate things with two separate kinds of effects, which means if my math is right, you have one, two, three, four, eight possibilities um, <laughs> of an answer. Uh, and each of the answers is different. And then the other side, you often expect in claims to have them pretty much parallel with one another. Well, they're not. Um, <laughs> a is referentia support for the referendum is consistent with international law, with no mention of what referentia actually did. Um, but B is even more interesting, which is that the secession and integration are consistent with international law. And of course, those two are two very different aspects. Uh, it raises very interesting questions that were addressed by the advisory opinion on Kosovo. And more importantly, because in your arguments, I'm sure you realize that you couldn't really rely on the law. Uh, it, there is an in, implicit invitation here, um, which should actually be taken seriously to try to think about what self-determination and statehood and secession should mean 
over the next 10, 20, or 30 years. Because the one thing that is certain is that the borders that we have today in the world that cover basically all the territory that there is won't be the same 30 or 40 years from now. And the real question is not necessarily how to maintain those borders, but how to ensure insofar as we can that the changes that will come will be changes that will look more like Scotland uh, than they do like uh, Iraq or Syria or a few other places we could name. So let me just stop there. Cool. And the floor is open for... Well, let me, let me say just a little okay. bit about the process because it might, this might be helpful to you. Um, the three of us um, have uh, written a number of these things. Um, tw now that I have your number correct, 13 in total. 13 in the total, <laughs> right. So we've, we've, we've been around the track. Uh, so that, that means that we, um, we have sort of internalized uh, the basic rules of writing a Jessup company, which I hope we've reflected here. Another thing to take into account, to factor in, is the three of us are very close friends. And so the process of editing this thing and polishing it, which over the years has on occasion become a little contentious because I know I'm going to say something now that will shock you, lawyers have egos. <laughs> you know, it's, it's true. It's true. All of them except the three of us, of course. So four of us, four of us. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, and, um, but that didn't really uh, pose much of a problem this year, which was very, very nice. The problem went through a number of iterations. Mm -hmm. um, we announced last year, I announced in my capacity as chairman of the board, I announced during the international rounds, as I will announce today, incidentally, what the topic was going to be. And of course, everybody immediately said, oh, it's about Russia and Ukraine and it's yeah. about Crimea. Well, yeah, there's some parallels there, but it's not about mm -hmm. that. It's about agnostica and reverentia. Mm -hmm. And there's no Marthite in Ukraine, I don't think. Is there? I, 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 uh, that's where they sold the 75%. They're right. trying to build a pharmaceutical industry there. Right. So originally, in the first iteration of the, of the Compromis, there was no Marthite. There was no Marthite treaty. The first iteration of the Compromis had the parties fighting over some currency manipulation issue. Uh, and it became quite complex, and we realized on, on reading it, you know, in the cold light of the morning, uh, that it just wasn't going to fly. It, it was too fact intense, it didn't have enough law, and we weren't entirely sure that the numbers were adding up correctly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we thought, all right, well, back to the drawing board. More on, on the that. numbers later. Yes, <laughs> More about indeed. That. So anyway, um, the, uh, the, our objective, as is the objective of Compromis authors every year, was to achieve balance, not necessarily on every single issue, that's too hard, but to achieve balance overall. And I think we accomplished that, and, and the statistics are showing us that there is not a substantial skewing of round outcomes in favor of either applicant or respondent. And that's the usual test that we apply. If we've made one, part, one side much stronger than the other, that's where we see the impact of that. So I think we got that right. We want something to be timely. We think this one is timely. Um, we want it to be, as Hurst said, something that is provocative in terms of legal thinking, but where at the end of the day, it's up to you. It's up to you to make the arguments. Um, both sides can be argued. Go for it. We, we always want to provide a stage from which, on which you can perform. That's what the Jessup is about. And that's what we've been seeing over this week and throughout the competition, and it's certainly what we're going to see at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So that's the, that's the intro. Yep. And, the let me, and let me write on what Stephen said about this not being about the Crimea region, the Black Sea region. It, in fact, isn't. And I know everybody's going to chuckle and so on and so forth. This Compromis was born of Dagmar's desire to do a hard treaty law problem. Treaty law comes up in every Jessup problem but it gets, it gets sucked up by these sexy issues. And Dagmar said, I want to make them work through grounds for termination. I want to work them through um, actual treaty interpretation rather than the students waving their hands. And then number two, from my desire to create a problem that plays up exactly what Hearst was talking about at the beginning, this tension between sort of the classic uh, notion of state succession uh, and the neoclassic self-determination and what a number of you argued this year you know this sort of uh, this sort of gap in the law about what what do we do now the world these two old rules 
don't work all the time anymore, and, and, and you've all found all of the other proposals, and you've, you've cited them at us all week, and we've replied, well, is that custom yet? <laughs> um, so, that is, it, so it really isn't about Crimea. It was about those two things, and it just so happened that as we were drafting it, um, several real-world events sort of inspired us. And, and of course, if we had simply phrased the problem as that, you guys would have gotten bored, so we, so we added the hooks. Anyway. Or the Marthite. Or the Marthite. <laughs> You know, there's, there's one other thing I wanted to add to that, which is, uh, as someone who's worn pretty much every hat for a number of years in this competition, um, the thing I am always very, very worried about is that we skew the compromise in such a way that one side has the morality and the other side has the law, right? Um, I used to joke with my teams, oh gosh, here comes another black-hatted weasel of the apocalypse. and. <laughs> They laugh, but we shouldn't because we have to balance this so that both sides get to grapple with what the law is. Because that's what we are, right? We're lawyers. And the facts are going to change, but the law will only change incrementally. So we were really concerned about trying to craft something, and that's also why we ditched that issue, mm -hmm. um, where there was legal argumentation on both sides rather than, oh, geez, I wish they'd done 478 clarifications so the fact I wanted was in the compromise. All right, so, and, and with that as a process point, I'd like to suggest that everyone follow the lead of the gentleman in the middle of the room. There is one microphone. <laughs> if people want to line up, uh, that's fabulous. Um, you can line up behind him because he's first. Yeah. Now, with the one additional caveat oh. that we need you to check your weapons at the door. Yes. <laughs> and, and I noticed they served us uh, fruit skewers, so <laughs> go ahead. Please. Thank you all very much. for It was a truly interesting problem this year, and I really did, as someone on the treaty interpretation side, really enjoyed getting to go in-depth into uh, termination and treaty interpretation. Um, on behalf of all the other treaty interpretation people, however, I did want to ask a little bit about Claim D specifically. Um, because of all of them, uh, that one seemed to have the equities in favor of agnostica pretty heavily, but it was difficult to come up with the law, especially outside of evolutionary treaty interpretation. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what other issues, other than countermeasures and treaty interpretation, um, you were envisioning for agnostica to bring forward on that side. Discuss yeah. that, but if you want to take that first. Yeah. Um, for me, the one other thing that gets um, excluded a lot in the Jessup is that we don't just have two primary sources of international law, we have three. So for me, point D was a way to bring up some of the general principles of law. Um, I, a lot of you who had the um, misfortune of having me on your bench heard me say, well, isn't this an abuse of right, for example, on that claim? Um, some teams knew that, other teams didn't, but really for me this was a way to try and tee up um, some general principles of law that hardly ever get played with in the Jessup and really dig into the doctrine behind those principles. Yeah, I think uh, I would just add that on that, on that very point, <clears throat> the, there is a, a kind of quality difference between question presented D and the other, the other three, mm -hmm. in that it really does require some careful parsing of language. And mm -hmm. some people think, well, that's not really very interesting. Um, it doesn't have the same sex appeal that uh, you know, self-determination does. But on the other hand, this is where the bleeding gets done in <laughs> treaties, right? This is, this is what people argue about when things go wrong. And it is simply, just as it is with statutory law, it is simply a matter of attempting to take the words apart, try to speculate as to what the intentions of the drafters were. We obviously deliberately did not give you any travaux preparatoire. We thought about it, but we didn't want to, we didn't want to help you. We wanted, to, we wanted both sides to argue from cold text, and they did. And, and I, then I will add, um, the the authors were shocked, uh, as either as coaches or as a judge, uh, we encountered at the national and international rounds reverential advocates claiming that Reverentia somehow owned or had written the software, yes. which was never our intention. Reverentia does not have a ministry of software development. <laughs> um, there are plenty of companies out there that write mining operating systems. <laughs> and, and, our, and so when teams would walk up and make an intellectual property rights argument, for example, that we continue yeah. to have the moral rights to the software, that was never intended. I mean, it was 
Uh, this, in my mind, it was always the case that this was operated under a license, whether it was off the shelf or custom, more likely custom made. Sure. Um, so uh, it, that was one that we never anticipated. And if I had it to do over again, I would have specified that Reverentia did this under a license. In fact, under a license from Baxter, from I think Baxter. would have made it awesome. <laughs> uh, but anyway, please go ahead. Thank you. I will be asking a question about submissions one, one and two. Mm -hmm. My question specifically is the fact that I really struggled to narrow what I wanted to argue. I thought 22 minutes or 45 minutes, even if I let my partner argue nothing, was not enough to argue everything under the sun as far as non-intervention and, and uh, the violation of international law. I think I would like to hear some feedback on why you chose to word the issue the way you did, leaving it so broad and so open-ended. I, I love the fact that it allowed me to be creative, but at the same time, it, it re I really struggled to fit everything I needed to say mm -hmm. and leave time for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Dagmar, Dagmar is going to first good one. Uh, yeah, well, we actually didn't think and you know, this is sometimes unintended consequences once you, the students, get a hold of the compromis. We didn't think we had gone that broad. Our biggest fight when we were putting this piece together, and it wasn't among ourselves, it was between us and our review committee, mm -hmm. was we actually didn't want the driver of the argumentation to be self-determination. That was never our intention. Um, our committee wanted us to put more facts in. Uh, we put some additional facts in to satisfy those people. Um, and then when we did the clarifications, you will notice we, we did some clarifications to try to pull back on that. Uh, because it wasn't really our intention to have self-determination be determined as much as we wanted it to be a driver to lead to the other questions. And, that, and, and to the extent it's broad, it was because we did not want to prejudice, exactly what Hurst said in his opening remarks, mm -hmm. we did not want to prejudice which route you would take. Right. Um, and so some of you would argue hard self-determination, and you would stand up there, and when, when Dagmar says more facts, it was more facts establishing whether or not they're a people. Right. And we deliberately left that vague because if it had been in there, everybody would have chosen self-determination. The point of that was not a self-determination argument, and, and for that matter, it wasn't really a state succession argument. Correct. It was a, here is a messy set of facts. Self-determination and Montevideo are certainly two ways one can attack them, and you all did both. Um, but we really didn't want to prejudice it because the question is so interesting. I mean, it, the question of how do you get from point A, oppressed group of folks, I, I guess I'll say, um, um, to point B, uh, independent state. And I would just add that um, the, what Michael and Dagmar have told, talked to you about is the substance of, of the answer to that question, but there's a procedural aspect to it too. <clears throat> and that is that um, one of the hardest things lawyers have to do is to organize complex mm -hmm. issues yes. into finite yep. space. Yes. And um, so you have to start prioritizing. Yeah. You, have a, you have a word count limit, so you can't keep writing forever, and you have that dastardly time card that keeps popping up. Question, who hears the buzzers in their dreams now? <laughs> Anybody? Um, and, uh, and so we, I personally like the idea that students are saying we had a really hard time fitting our argument into the time limit. That shows me that we, that we gave you that issue, that procedural issue, that training in advocacy, which is really what this is about. Go ahead. Oh, hi, my name is Nijma. I've been affiliated with Jessup since 2012, so I wait for the compromis uh, every single year to come out. And um, I was surprised when I saw, to be honest, this year's compromis. It doesn't look um, the same as compromis we've seen before. So it's a bit shorter, and it seemed to me a bit more, um, I don't want to say simple because I was judging and I saw how difficult the issues um, the students were discussing before the panel. So it's very complex, but by surface when I first saw the compromis, I was a bit jealous that, oh, they got it easy this year, <laughs> which it wasn't. So I want to know what was the purpose behind, and I know it must have been so difficult because it was such a smaller compromis mm -hmm. uh, with such difficult issues. First, what was the purpose behind that, and second, how did you... Um, you know, try to shorten it up. <laughs> so, Thank you. 
I'll, I'll take first crack at this. Um, first of all, thank you on both points. That was what we were shooting for, shorter and more simple. Um, and the reason for that is um, uh, there is a difference in resources, uh, book resources, electronic resources, access to the internet, so on and so forth, among the teams in this competition. And historically, I've been involved with the Jessup competition for 20 years. Um, historically, we've seen that when it gets too complex, when you're pulling from too many different sources of law, when we see that reflected in the results. Um, we see the schools, not necessarily the English-speaking schools, not necessarily the Western schools, but the schools with a lot of resources, um, really beating up on the schools with fewer resources. Mm -hmm. Be and, and we don't want this to turn into who's got a bigger library. Uh, so that was deliberate. As for how we did it, um, <laughs> as Stephen said, well, as Stephen said at the beginning, we have known each other for a long time. And um, unlike years. in years, unlike in years where we have authors who are working at arm's length from the editorial committee or authors who are experts in different parts of the compromise, so on and so forth, all three of us worked on the entire compromise at all times. I mean, this was a very holistic approach to the compromise. So um, when we were making changes, we were not, as you sometimes do in a collaborative effort, tacking things on to fix things. We were changing the whole thing around to, um, uh, to keep the Pro to be, keep the problem um, holding together. So that was a big help because in most years when, when we have a different set of authors, um, it really becomes a problem. We have found a gap in the compromise. Well, let's add a paragraph. Okay, we found another gap in the compromise. Let's add another paragraph. Or a QP. Right, or a question presented. Let's add a, yeah, let's add a semicolon in the questions presented and add another uh, yeah. sub, sub question. This year we didn't do that. This year the changes were organic and uh, uh, we really were on the same page most of the summer. So and we didn't we didn't set about deliberately and focusing on writing a shorter compromise than uh, has been the case in recent years. <clears throat> but we were very pleased when that when that actually happened because um, very often the sheer length and complexity of the compromise just throws people off, and it destroys the narrative. It destroys a lot of the the, the fun part, which is understanding the facts well enough that you kind of become part of the plot yourself mm -hmm. as an advocate for one side or the other. And so we strive for that. There, there are, incidentally, nobody's asked me about this yet, but I hope somebody will. There are a number of things in the company that are sort of inside jokes, and perhaps you noticed some of them, some hmm. oddities. Um, and the names are all there for a reason. Very, very little got through this company that was not deliberate. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are a couple of things that did, as yeah. Michael right. said. A few things we'd like, I think, maybe to do differently. But, um, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of buried treasure there. I remember years ago, there was a company in which one of the plot developments was uh, the signing of a peace treaty. <clears throat> and you know, peace treaty was a big deal, and the parties came together to sign it, and the foreign ministers were there, and whatever. And the compromis author produced, as part of the compromis, the menu of the dinner that they had after signing the peace treaty. Well, we didn't quite go that far this year. Could have, I suppose. Um, but we had fun in other ways, and still kept it short. I want to add one brief thing to your question, because it goes less to process than to substance. Um, an enduring frustration for me as a competitor, as a coach, and as a judge has been that so often these problems are so complex that the students don't get to dig deep into yeah, an issue. Yeah, sure. And since our objective here is to create a conversation between the bench and the advocate to solve a legal problem, depth generally is better than breadth. And so that was actually for me a very conscious choice. Hello. Again, thank you for the compromise because it was my companion for these past months. But the question is, why retrocession? Like, how did you come up with retrocession? Why not call it restitution? Why, why drive it back to the will of the population? Were you thinking of the separate opinion in Western Sahara? Like, why retrocession again? Like, it drove me insane. I didn't find anything about retrocession for like four months. And I've seen that that's been a problem for everybody because so many memorials I've read didn't even deal with retrocession because I remember. Aim, aim your skewers that yeah, way. That, I, 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 was, <laughs> I was just informed that this is my word. I, it's not consistent with my memory. I, um, I thought this was somehow a part of collective consciousness. Oh, sure. um, well, I think the idea was that if, in fact, the secession and annexation, integration, whatever it is, uh, were in, ineffective, 
uh, or, or even worse, illegal, then um, uh, what, where do we stand? What's next? And, and I think a, a question that I didn't hear asked a lot during the rounds that I either judged or, or watched my team uh, was the question about what, what do you want out of this? Yeah. What, what is the goal? Now, there have been many Jessup companies that have focused intensely on the question of remedy. Mm -hmm. This one really didn't. So the idea of retrocession was to provide, at least with respect to that QP, um, a clear description of what it was that the party was asking for. That was, that was we nothing more subtle than we, that. We were struggling with the, uh, also struggling with the fact you know, that this wasn't going to be a, a, declar a declaratory uh, judgment without legal effect. Right. And so we had to go back and forth because the court would simply pass on that issue. We're not simply going to declare what the law is if there's not a, a live dispute and if there's not. And it was balancing too because yeah. you yeah. end up with a problem where uh, let's assume for a moment that the court rules that the Let's assume the court first decides it can and then does rule that the secession was unlawful, right? Then what do you do as respondent? It was supposed to also tee up the de facto state argument, the effectivité argument, um, so that there would be something else for the respondent to argue. And as for the specific word, we had already used two loaded words, integration or reintegration and annexation in the prayer for relief once apiece, so we had to find a third word. <laughs> And incidentally, we, I think, I think it can be said, yep. we put the word annexation on the cover page of the company. We shouldn't have done that. Yeah, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. That's on us. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, first of all, I also want to thank you a lot for the company. I totally agree with, with what has been said regarding the treaty interpretation that I also worked on, and I enjoyed it a lot. And I have two questions. The first is a rather short one. What was the value of Article 7 in the Marta Convention? You were thinking about it a lot, especially because it shows some difference to Article 6 in its wording and the time period. And the second one is for my co colleague who lost his voice at Aww. one of the parties. <laughs> um, we, we realized that there's a subsubsequent practice argument as RMT sold to these worldwide collectors. However, the threshold for sales outside Reverend and East Agnostica was never met. Was there any argument value behind this factual thing? Yes. Thank you. Hmm. So, no. I'll, I'll, I'll answer the second one first. I mean, the short answer is yes. I mean, that's why we put the subsequent practice in, and that's why we ended up clarifying that there were these, these annual meetings and everything else. We wanted to really hang a lampshade, so to speak, on the fact that this was a living treaty where there was, there was subsequent practice. Um, uh, we wanted to make sure that, uh, that there was sale to third parties and, uh, and to let you guys argue whether this was a, merely a difference of degree, that the collectors were basically precursors to big, big pharmaceutical companies, or whether it was a difference of kind. Um, yeah. So yes, and I can see you nodding. Yes, you were correct. Um, yeah. As for the first one, as for Article 7. I think that was me. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, was sure. you. that was you. Um, yeah, the, the, in fact, Article 6 and 7, I think, were me. And the idea was that we wanted to be sure that we, we were um, contextualizing the Marthai Control Act and thinking, all right, so what are they, what, what was it anticipated back in 1938? It was anticipated that the Marthai would all flow in one direction, but you've got to mine the stuff. And since Reverentia was responsible for the original you know, investment of everything but the facilities themselves, whatever that means, um, the, the equipment had to be able to go back, uh, go from um, uh, Reverentia into Agnostica. As far as <clears throat> any lack of parallelism of the language, I'm just looking at them now. I'm not sure I, I see there's any. Yeah. No, any, he didn't any, say any, lack of parallelism. Yeah, no. He said, "What does it add?" Oh, I see. Having they both are, of them. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. that's yeah. it. It's, it's and 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 the any any difference in language you see is simply because Article Six is you know both of them had to repeal. At least this is what we had intended, and Article Seven is really just a unilateral. You know, we're dropping the barriers so the equipment. That, that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Next. Good morning, and thank you for the compromise. I have two questions on the prayer for relief. The first one is the third prayer for relief of the respondent, which says that the convention remained in force until the 1st of March 2013. Was it the intention so the participants engaged with the issues of state succession or something else? Because it appears like that, according to the respondent, the convention was in force 
when East Agnostic was also independent. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the second question is, uh, <laughs> okay, and the second question is on the second preferably for the applicant, and one of the propositions is that the secession was illegal. Did you expect that the participants would challenge the classic notion that secession is a legal neutral act in the eyes of international mm -hmm. law? Mm -hmm. Or did yes. you say yes. something yes. else? Yeah, that's, that's an easy one. Yeah, yeah. The second one, and I'll give Dagmar a moment to respond to the first one. The answer to the second one is yes, absolutely. And, and almost everybody in this room caught that. Yeah. Okay, that yeah. was, yeah. Well, and the date thing was done on purpose for a couple of reasons. One, um, if you've ever seen a compromise that I've had a heavy hand in, I like things to turn in on themselves and force competitors to think about what taking a particular position in one argumentation will do to their co-agents argument. And uh, we set that date up so that uh, there could be a little bit of a trap if you're not careful in terms of just exactly what the person who quotes, quoted the question pointed out, which is that you have a period of time during which you're claiming a treaty is in effect, but you're also claiming that the ter territory, which is the subject of that treaty, is no longer under the control of the party against whom you're seeking to enforce the treaty. Yeah, that was completely done on purpose. And when Dagmar says a trap, uh, that what we were talking about was a first applicant or a first respondent attempting to overstate their case. Yep. And so then yep. you end up treading into your co age and then, you know, as just we just up judges are apart from authors, we're simple people. We like simple <laughs> pleasures. We like saying to a it, it, it we get a thrill that goes throughout our entire body when we get to say to an agent, but agent, your co agent just told us <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and that that too, I mean, I made the point earlier about time, time management and organization and editing being very important aspects of advocacy, but teamwork is also a very important aspect of advocacy. And when we, when we put into the compromise issues like this, we are making you work together on your memorials and on developing your arguments, and that is, a, is an important pedagogical objective of the exercise also. Next. <laughs> Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Ritwik Bhattacharya. Before I begin, I'd like, you, like to thank you for a beautifully balanced compromise. And I had the fortune to work on the last two issues and have two questions pertaining to it. Uh, the first one is, what was the relevance of permanent sovereignty over natural resources to the last two issues? And uh, the second question being, is, to what extent did you want the, two, the issues to be distinct from each other? Because if I can take an example, when you were arguing countermeasures as part of the last issue, that was dependent on you proving that the treaty had not been validly yeah. terminated. So yeah. did you want a separate basis of wrongfulness, saying like an a wrongful expropriation of sorts, so make sure that the issues were distinct from each other? Yeah. So again, second question first, only because I can remember it better. Um, <laughs> we uh, were not uh, reaching for the expropriation card. What we were reaching for, in addition to the um, uh, countermeasures, which obviously, as you say, presupposes that there had been a violation of the law, and we've got to establish that. But we were looking for just a basic treaty interpretation issue. Mm -hmm. It was a basic deconstruct the language. What does it mean? And some uh, parties argued that the removal of the software, which didn't belong to the party removing it, was theft. It was simple theft. Well, what, what is theft in international law? Well, presumably, there's a general principle of law that's established as law in all civilized nations under Article 38.1c that says you're not allowed to take somebody else's property without permission. Argue that. And many, many teams did. What was, you what what was, was the first question? The first question was permanent sovereignty over natural oh, resources. That, right. yeah, yeah. And yeah, that, that was intended to be in there. And that was intended to be in there to test one of our favorite Jessup uh, topics, which is, OK, it sounds all very nice and pretty, but is it actually binding it's international right. law? Yeah. 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 Yep. Uh, yeah. Nothing to add. <laughs> Next. So I've already lost the bet, I need to inform you, because we were talking about this earlier. And I said, I am certain, and I'll bet a drink or something I've said, um, that the first question is going to be, where did you get the names from? And nobody has asked us that yet. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> he's, fi he's fishing for a question here. <laughs> anyway, please. Uh, hi, good morning. My name is Abdul Waris Bakhtia. And I have a question with regard to the first issues pertaining both applicant and respondent. Why you have used the word of encouragement for the applicant and the word of support for responding or them uh, or the support and encouragement or the same or they are different why have used 
Why you didn't use the same word for both applicant and respondent? Why you did not use the encouragement or the support for both uh, uh, the first issues pertaining to the applicant and respondent? Thank you. So, good question. It is a, and the non-parallelism in all of the prayers for relief is intentional, and you know, those of you that will be coaching in the future, when you see it, it's a flag. In this case, we, it is a conceit of Compromis authors that we role play and we try to put ourselves in the, in the seats of the negotiators of this, of this treaty. And so when we did the first draft of it, um, um, you know, it was parallel, and it usually does start out perfectly parallel mirror image, so on and so forth. And Stephen piped up and said, well, um, counsel for a respondent, whatever, whatever a lawyer they hire, a hired gun they hire to, to jointly draft this compromise. James would, Crawford. Probably, well, not, not, any, anymore. not anymore. First time. Um, but um, reverential would never allow the word encouragement to appear in its prayer for relief. You know, what they did was, and they would never do encouragement of the referendum, you know, blah, blah, blah. They, they would want support, and so we, okay, we'll do support. And then Stephen piped up and said, but there's no way agnostic, they want to, they want to say that there was more than simply supporting a referendum, they actually encouraged the referendum, because that's what they're saying is wrong. You know, simply saying go referendum isn't what agnostic is complaining about. They're complaining about the whole course of conduct to encourage it, to make it happen, and then to make sure it did happen. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, that really was us role playing um, and, and this is why judges will, will hit you with questions like, you know, well, agent, if that fact was, if, if that was a material fact, wouldn't your client, wouldn't, wouldn't Agnostica or Reverentia have included it in the compromise? In our minds when we draft these things, we are thinking about what would the two parties agree to? And no, they wouldn't, they, Agnostica doesn't want this to be about supporting the referendum. They want to talk about the whole course of conduct. So that's where it came from. And the difference between the two words is in Agnostica's mind, the, the crux of the case is this course of conduct beginning with the fact that Reverentia is the first, is the first, uh, the president of Reverentia is the first person on earth to mention this particular process. He, he's the one that came up with the idea. And uh, all the way through to the fact of the referendum and then the consequences. Whereas Reverentia says, uh, as many of you argued, you know, forest, I see no forest, I see trees. We supported the referendum um, out of the kindness of our hearts. And, uh, and so let's talk about our support for the referendum. Nothing to add. Well, words matter. That's yep, words line. matter. Um, good morning. I'm Mariana Ferrella. And well, first, to thank you for making this really a fun problem that, in which my life revolved for the, last, for the past seven months or so. And um, as you know, at some point, you start reading the compromise so much that these, <laughs> all these words have you try to find secret messages in them and everything it has a hidden <laughs> meaning. So there I, were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I couldn't help but notice yeah, that on sure. claim B, there was for Agnostica, you said the annexation of mm -hmm. East Agnostica mm -hmm. and for Reverentia, integration. Mm -hmm. And there was a, yeah. I kept looking for a difference on it. I couldn't find any substantial difference, but integration sounds all nice and pretty, so it fits Reverentia better and annexation. Yeah has more of this forceful idea, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to know if that was intentional. That was very intentional. <laughs> yeah, it was very intentional. And there was obviously were not the only words um, right. that bore uh, a lot more meaning than perhaps you gave them credit for. Right. But one, one thing that you, we, uh, we do regularly, as, as has already been said, that's very important, is to try to make the compromise realistic, not only in terms of the plot line being realistic, but the choice of words being, after all, what is a compromise? It's a stipulation, it's an agreement by the parties on how to frame a question to be decided by a court. So it's not like a complaint that you file in a domestic court, it's an agreement. And so the language has to be language that can be agreed, except in the prayer for relief, where each side gets to say its own thing. Now the other place where you get to, to do a little bombast is in the direct quotations. <laughs> and so I, this one I've got to point out because I have not yet heard a team that picked up on this. Um, in the speech of um, President um, Nuvalos, he... Who's in the back of the room, by the way? Well, yeah, we'll, int we'll introduce him. There he is. There is, there is a... Um, in the speech of President Nuvalos, um, he... Uh, everybody seized on his saying 
um, that you know, in the event, uh, uh, you know, case of the referendum going the right way, uh, you know, if you wish to be free, we will do everything in our power. And everybody focused on does that include violence? Does that include a threat of violence and whatnot? Many teams argued at length about whether the, the, the deal was cooked. That is, there was really no movement to make East Agnostica independent. It wasn't a two-step process, secession followed by annexation integration, but really a one-step process, thereby imputing more liability to reverential. The word that nobody picked up on, which I put in deliberately, was the word compatriots. Mm -hmm. A compatriot is someone who is a citizen of the same country as you. Mm -hmm. And so what he was, what Novalis was saying is, I already see the Agnorebs as citizens of Reverentia. That supports the idea for Reverentia, for Agnostica, if you want to go that way, saying this was all part of a plan. As far as I know, nobody saw that. But there's always got to be something in there that nobody catches. Next. Uh, good morning, everyone. I have a little question about Article 3 of the special agreement. In last year, you, uh, you, uh, in, in Article 3, it is mentioned uh, on the basis of rules and principles of international law. But in this year, uh, the Article 3 um, uh, presides like in, uh, rules and the principles of general international law. So the term of general international is to um, preclude something like... That's, that's a mistake, and it will be fixed next year. <laughs> and, and, I know, and I know why the question is coming up, because it came up in a championship round of a national round. The, uh, now, it's a mistake, it, and it's an old mistake. It's, uh, it's, been in there, it's been in there for about 16 years. The language originates with uh, UNCLOS 1982, and whoever the author, probably Stephen, 16 years ago, um, it probably just pulled it from UNCLOS 1982 because it was a law of the sea issue or something. And then, honestly, that section usually to be perfectly honest, just gets copied and pasted we from one year to the it. next. Uh, you know, the ILSA office is supposed to look at it and tell us if there's, you know, well, we've got to change the names of the parties and whatever. Um, it came up this year in the championship round of the Chinese national round. Um, the, a member of the uh, International Law Commission was serving as chief judge or as president, and he asked, the applicant got up and he said, Agent, before you begin, what do you mean by this in Article 3? And the poor oralist said, Bleh. <laughs> so then respondent got up and uh, he said, I'll ask you the same question I asked uh, the applicant. And even though he had 45 minutes to, uh, to think about it, he said, Bleh. <laughs> and I was, I was at the round, I immediately texted these two and said, uh, we've got to fix this. There is no, there is no good answer. It's, it's from UNCLOS 82 and it has to do with the difference between the lex specialis of law of the yeah, sea exactly and right. everything else. In this con divorced from that context, it means nothing. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Morning, Your Excellencies. Um, I'd have a question, sorry, uh, about the fun part you had writing the compromise, if, if at all. Uh, did you put a big trick in the compromise, like yes. a big move, someone still hadn't seen? So, what was your big move on the compromise? What was the big what? The big trick of the compromise, oh, the one we didn't see. You are, you're accusing us of trickery? No, no, I don't know. <laughs> Just asking if you put a big move in the compromise, something that no one has seen so far and you enjoy doing it. Well, go ahead. You got Just, just gave you one, the use of the word compatriots. Well, here's a bigger um, one. There is another word that's important. Mm -hmm. And we talked about actually teeing it up more in the prayer. And these guys convinced me, ah, no, 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 the teams will get it, the teams will get it. Yeah. Um, which is, we said the secession and. Oh, right. right? Yeah. And what that sets up is the fact that the court has to, as someone I think already mentioned, first analyze the question of secession, oh, Hurst mentioned that, and then answer the question of annexation or integration, depending which side you're on. But what nobody did was look to see whether the question of secession was actually a legal dispute opposable between these two parties. Where's East Agnostica? Yeah, well, we actually, yeah. I, I heard that issue. And, and, but, the, but we didn't see that from a lot of teams, and yeah. we were hoping we would see a bit more of that. Please. I, I had no trickery. That's because he's so pure and innocent. Yeah. 
Good morning. I have a question about procedural requirements for treaty termination. So, in, view, in your view, Agnostica could not terminate the Marthite Convention due to material breach because it simply did notify Reverend of it. <laughs> and in your view, a procedural flaw deprives a party of its substantial right. And could you give us any real life example because we actually didn't find any? Yeah. <sighs> I, okay, so this is, I, I'm, I'm guessing neither of the two teams that are in the final round are in this room. Can you ask me that after the final match? Because this really gets into um, a couple of traps that could be sprung and so on and so forth by the, by the final bench. That one is getting a little too into how I would, think, you, prefer, yeah. Yeah, how I would you prefer we argue this issue? And, and we have one more match to go. So great question, would love to discuss it. Find me at the gala. See you tonight. Yeah. See you tonight. <laughs> I, I'm thinking about how I would answer that, and I've got no way to sanitize it. Right. Hello, good morning. I have um, one and a half or maybe two questions, if you allow me to present both. And they will be divided into five parts. <laughs> no, that's also already dividing uh, claim B into two parts. And actually, the, <laughs> the uh, first, well, our impression was that it's divided actually into five parts, oh. being the secession is uh, illegal and without effect, the annexation is illegal without effect, and retrocession should not be ordered or remains part of the territory. I wonder how annexation can be without effect. For me, annexation is a matter of fact, and if someone annexes another territory, it is just effective. And I'm sorry, I, I'm not understanding, I'm not understanding the understanding point. Then, yeah. I mean, you said that claim, okay, maybe I just got wrong. Claim B should be read as entailing a lot of questions. And I so I read so it as succession and question. subsequent annexation sure are both You're illegal and without effect. Take these, take these different pieces, you know, the secession and annexation right. is illegal and without effect. And so he's picking oh, 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 these, oh, how can an annexation be without effect since it's a fact on the ground? Yeah, right. yeah, right. that was, I was wondering. Right, right. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that's one we really didn't think about because we were focused much more on the end result because we had that piece in there uh, for purposes of then getting to the question that Stephen was talking about earlier, which is what do you do when you have, let's assume there's 11 million Agnarevs and it's been two and a half years. That, that, I think we weren't focused on that in the way that yeah. you guys were. Also, it would have been very awkward to phrase it exactly the way you and I would prefer to see it, which would have been East Agnostica's secession um, uh, uh, we're, we're looking yeah, at B, the first B. The, the purported secession of East Agnostica is illegal and without effect, yeah. and the subsequent annexation is illegal. Yeah. Uh, then that, that, that the prayer for relief becomes 40 pages long. Well, and, um, okay, we just wondered if it was on purpose. Um, no, no, the, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. And the second question would be, you said, the, the big difference is in claim B, one claims it's more or less not regulated anti national, the other one claims it's illegal. What we heard a lot and what our own mistake maybe was, was that we said, well, it's not legal. But does this lead to the same conclusion as being illegal? And I think this left out the space in between. Lotus. So how do yeah. you get, but how do you get illegality? Was the intention to argue that indeed the East Agnostics are bound by territorial integrity, but what other principle would they violate when seceding illegally? It's territorial integrity. I'm not sure. I think it is territorial sure integrity, but you. I think we differ on the bench about the effect of the whole thing. Um, I take a very strong position compared to my colleagues that the question of secession was never properly before the court, but I differ with my colleagues on but, that. Yeah, but she's wrong. Yeah, of no. course. <laughs> and we outvote her. And, um, two to one. Two there one. you go. <laughs> I don't get extra points for being a girl. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Thank you for a very enlightening answer. So far, I have two questions. First, concerning compromise numbers 24 to 27, which tell the story of Mrs. Sati and his grandfather. And I think it takes up a lot of space in the compromise, and I've seen no team making any substantial argument yeah. out of it. Yeah. So my question was, was there something that nobody has seen, or is it just a policy statement or policy so argument? So there are, there are I, I'm, I, I came up with Sati. Um, we needed a way to connect. This is a plot issue. We needed a way to connect issues one and two with issues three and four. Um, uh, let, me, let, me start with the non or let me start with the legal one. We needed actual, to show that the MCA was actually being enforced, and so we could have given you statistics, but we said, you know, we've got, we've got two or three paragraphs. Let's tell the story of one life that was affected. But plot-wise, we needed something that would connect these fairly dry 
uh, disputes that happened up to that, that point with the revolution, you know, with, with the overthrow of the agnostic and authorities, um, that, would, that would actually work as, as, as a plot. A catalyst. And, and so we needed a catalyst. And so I will tell you, this started, I, you know, I was pacing back and forth, and, and, you know, we had discussed this, we had our two halves of it, and we were happy, and, and I had to brainstorm on, okay, what, it's a dry issue. People don't care about these issues one and two, the people in the street, the East Agnosticans. So what if he walks the salt to the sea? Yes, ah. I remember that. And so that. <laughs> he was originally named Gohandas Mandi. And, uh, and I'm, okay, so he walks the salt to the sea, but they're not going to revolt over that. That would lead to passive resistance or more articles in the newspapers. Or um, what, if the, what if the cops arrested him as he walked the salt to the sea? Okay, and he, they throw him in prison. Okay, well, again, we're not, we're not there yet. We need something that's going to get these people to, to start calling for overthrow. We needed to move it from the politicians in parliament and the academics who've, who've been complaining to really a popular movement so that the compromise doesn't happen over the span of 80 years. It's, it's happening you know, within, within months. And then, it was, and then it was, okay, let's make him a young man. And okay, let's have the grandfather kick off. And oh, and then, and then the part that, that these two just were groaning. No, I was with you on <laughs> no, no, the when they were, when, no, no, the suicide. Yeah, let's have him commit suicide. But no, the part that they were both groaning was the forgive me, grandfather. I mean, really. And uh, I mean, it was. They were just oh, God. Um, um, and, but it was to. It was a plot connector point. We needed to do two things. We needed to show you that the MCA was being enforced, it was affecting people's lives, and make it, you know, tug at the heartstrings a little so that you could then use those facts if you so chose with the judges. None of you chose to do that. And, but the real one was just a plot point. How do you get from a dry treaty issue that the people on the streets don't care about to Les Miserables, you know? Um, so. yeah. Thank you very much. And the second question is, did teams come up with arguments which were so creative that even you didn't think of them before? <laughs> Um, can um, Steven Schneebaum write a compromise so big that not even he can move it? Um, uh, yeah, I, I heard a lot of arguments. I wasn't anticipating. I'll give you one example. Um, we've been talking about this a lot. The, uh, the state responsibility issue for the Branch and Martha Trust. I'm sorry, we didn't anticipate that that was going to take anybody any time at all. We assumed it was a laydown that RMT, that Reverentia was responsible. It is a laydown. And that was that. Yeah. But uh, uh, now, I coach a team, so I was not allowed to see the bench memorandum. Well, all we, three of us do, so none of us saw it, which was very interesting. So we went, I went and took my team into the regional round in February, and all of a sudden, the second speaker is getting questions about state responsibility for the actions of RMT. And I thought, immediately, I thought, okay, it's got to be in the bench memo, because it can't be that so many judges are thinking down that road on their own initiative. Uh, sure enough, the other day when I could look for the first time, there it was. We did not anticipate that. We didn't intend that. And you know, yep. that. so that's an example. Yeah. Well, while I'm not the official timekeeper, uh, we're getting close to about quarter past twelve. So if you all have reasonably short questions, because we know the answers are going to be very long. <laughs> no, um, but, but interesting. We, yes, but short. interesting <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, and, 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 and everybody well who's standing development. up now will get a chance to ask their short question, right, and so then we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. <laughs> so we'll cut it off with the gentleman in the gray sweatshirt. Yes. sweatshirt. Right, so you Go. five get your questions, and then we're done. Go. Good Go. morning. Oh, my question is, is just one, and it's very short. So in the third issue, when you talked about how Agnostica ceased to uh, continue with the Marthite Convention, and in any event that they did not breach it, my question is that did you anticipate that uh, we would have to argue at any point uh, that the MCA as well as the lease to Baxter are in conformity with the Marthite Convention? The MCA, yes. certainly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, we, I can give you the further. I can give you the longer version, you know. But, but the answer is yes. And, and from the way you phrased the question, you understand what the yes means. So, I mean, we expected you to to fight against that, to beat your head against that wall. I mean, because you have to. I mean, it's one of the things you had to do. So. So, so my question is, uh, when the special agreement stipulates that uh, the legal consequences of the judgment will be agreed upon by the parties after the judgment comes, why isn't retrocession one of those legal consequences which the parties should agree to by virtue of the special agreement and not something that the court should order in the first place? 
No structure. Why is the court called upon to order that if the legal consequences are something that the party should determine? I see what it, I'm, I'm not. Oh, sorry. What he's talking about? Yeah. 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 So what he's saying, what he's saying is, in the stuff at the beginning, in the prefatory mm -hmm. material, we say the parties also agree to be bound by the judgment. Right. Sure. And he's saying. Isn't, isn't retrocession one of those legal effects that should have been negotiated by the parties after oh, the judgment? Oh, interesting. It, it, um, certainly, yeah, could it's an interesting it certainly could be. It certainly could be. I heard some teams you. argue that very effectively. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. had not thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have no answer. Um, I heard teams argue it that could, well. It, we could, we could have that. done it that way. As we said before, retrocession is in there because we wanted to give um, uh, Reverentia something else to argue. Um, a remedy to argue. A, a remedy to argue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we could have certainly, if we felt more strongly that there was enough enough there for reverentia, we could have put it into the, by implication, we could have omitted it from the from the main part, and then it would have been one of those legal consequences. Yes. Yeah. Next. My name is Olga Baklan, and I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Firstly, about the United Nations Charter generally. Why did you decide to choose such wording? And secondly, in issue four, for applicant, you use software at Mathite extracting facilities. And an issue for the respondent in the Mathite extracting facilities, were there any special meaning, maybe in case of interpretation, or it's just? Mm -hmm. On that second one, not really. Yeah. Um, who wants to take the first one? I'm trying to remember what it was. Yeah, I, I will, about the uh, UN Charter generally. Um, we just wanted to make it clear that we were not discouraging creativity. Um, you know, the, the violation of territorial integrity seemed like a pretty obvious argument to make. Whether it's a good argument or not is another issue, but it's an obvious one. Principle of non-intervention, I guess, even more obvious. Okay. Um, but what else? What will clever teams come up with? You know, we, we want to give them room. Exactly. We wanted to give you room. I mean, there was a point that 10 minutes after we had sent this off into the void and the internet spread it to all of you, when, when usually you're trying to grab it back and say, one more change. Uh -huh. um, one of my thoughts was, I wonder if there's a self-defense issue in there that we didn't think about, which is, it, it was that kind of concern that we said, let's let them run with it, and then we'll see, yeah. we'll see what they come back at us with. And we like, we like doing that because yeah. it brings out the creativity, which is, again, a key element of advocacy. Yeah. Hello. I wanted to ask you something that's not a matter of law, but maybe a funny fact from the for compromise. When you chose the term Boxing Day Massacre, were you referring to an old folder match? Boxing Day is an actual holiday. Because on December 26, 1980, I think, there was a big football match where a team famous... I don't oh, the, the, yes, that yes, Boxing yes. Day massacre, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right, yes. We didn't do that on purpose, but now that you remind us of that event, yeah, that does come back. <laughs> we could have called it St. Stephen's Day massacre. Yeah. We could have called it... Uh, yeah, well, in fact, somebody, remember, somebody on the editorial committee objected to Boxing Day massacre because yes. they thought only people from the UK will know what Boxing Day is. Right. And we said, but so what? You look at some of the no, no, you're, you're right. We, you're right. We had to call it something, and uh, so I went on Wikipedia and looked up all of the things that were celebrated on that day. I think we also could have called it um, Angolan Day of National Liberation. Well, St. Stephen's Day. Yeah, St. Stephen. That's what I was saying. St. Oh, Stephen's Day Massacre. Let him, let him have his question. Go. Hi. So, last question for the day. Um, in the first batch of materials uh, of basic materials, um, we had we, there was an indication towards accelerated custom, and it's I'm sorry. Used, uh, Sorry, um, I wanted to ask you whether um, how you expected teams to apply um, the principle of accelerated custom. Well, it's not a principle, but the, the I, first batch of basic materials had an inclusion of something uh, regarding uh, accelerated custom. Yeah. Right. We can't answer that question because we have nothing as authors who are also okay. coaches to do with the basic materials. They don't let us, they kick us out okay. of the room so, after we so do So we the have players. no idea why that was in there or what the ILSA executive uh, office or the bench memo so authors if I could, If I could just rephrase my question. Okay. From Reverentia on prayer B, yes. um, there's evidently a lack of state practice to um, put forth the uh, remedial secession, external self-determination yes, non-secession right, right. argument. Is. Do you think it was possible um, and it would have been a good idea for teams to use um, the uh, evolving methodology of the, of the ICJ in, in accelerated custom to in fact argue that? Because on, on the, the general No, because standard, there's not even an accelerated custom on it. I mean, remedial secession is a problematic argument because, um, at least in our view, yes. and we could be wrong. And, it, it, all of them, we're all three wrong together. Yeah, and first, any, any position on that? No, I agree with you. Okay, yeah. we're all four wrong together. <laughs> yeah, there's, it, it, that's a very problematic argument. And accelerated custom doesn't help you because even, even by that doctrine, it hasn't reached the requisite level of, of state practice okay. or opinion of yours. Uh, well, no, 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 no. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. No, because Hurst has something substantive yeah, to say. No, okay. Just gonna and then we, we do want for, uh, we will give him 20 seconds. Anybody have a buzzer um, for President Antonis Novalis to uh, have the last word, since, of course, in a real Jessup round, it is the respondent who gets the sir rebuttal. Mr. President, do you have anything to say to the assembled masses? <laughs> Other than he's woefully underdressed for the event. <laughs> really expecting a, a yeah. huge crowd looking at me and me having to make an unprepared strategy battle and I think that <clears throat> I had trouble with the um, secession slash annexation slash integration and the opposability uh, question and I had actually I wanted to ask a question if I'm allowed <laughs> It, you did this. Yeah, you, I did it. You, it. Ask you ask it. You fix it. Yes. Yep. I, this is all you. You ask <laughs> it. Go ahead. I just, <clears throat> I had some, I, I was also judging, so that's weird for the president that actually he's on the respondent side judging, but it happened. And the, somebody tried to uh, raise the argument that the secession is a prerequisite for the integration or the cessation, so we had to discuss the question of the secession as a prerequisite for the annexation, because if the secession was unlawful, then the annexation was, by definition, be unlawful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I, again, this is where my colleagues and I differ. Um, I was not very accepting of that argument because I really parsed the court case law to see when it would be that a court would take a strict line on the doctrine of opposability and when a court would not take a strict line and whenever there was an underlying potential threat to peace and security in, in, in the dispute, the court would tend to take a very strict line on opposability and refuse to hear the claim. So that is why I differ with these two. Obviously, I voted again. Right. Obviously, I didn't hire the best yeah. persons on representing my country, but... <laughs> I know, I'd have kicked you out of court, honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just uh, thank our not only devious, but also witty and, uh, and very intelligent uh, Compromis yeah. authors this year. And also thank all of you, because without you, none of this process would take place. I hope you feel that those hours and weeks and months and sleepless nights uh, we're all worth it. I hope you had fun as well as actually getting to know a little bit what it is like to be a certain kind of lawyer. So let's thank our company office.